grew up on the roof. All right, it is the top of the hour, 9 a.m., so I will get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I am very glad, we are very glad that you could join us today. My name is Kara Cleveland, and I am the supervisor of the Indiana State Professionals State Libraries Professional Development Office. Uh, I also serve on the Indiana State Library we have a public or a personal, I cannot talk today, a professional development committee, and I serve on that as well. Uh, I will be the host and question moderator for today's session, Developing Tech Intuition, presented by Marianne McKenzie and Alex Hampton of the Indianapolis Public Library. Uh, McKenzie prefers to go by McKenzie, so we won't be doing the Mary Ann name today. Uh, she just let me know that. Just a couple of announcements to register for other webinars or other trainings available. Just see the uh, Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov backslash library. And you can also go to our continuing education website to get up to date offerings. This session is about an hour, so you will receive one TLEU for this presentation. If you're watching an archived recording of this webinar, instructions on how to obtain your TLEU are in the video's description on YouTube. You can also find the instructions on our website. All right, so I am, I guess, I am going to actually let Mackenzie and Alex introduce themselves because it looks like I did not include that on the script. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Mackenzie and Alex. Thank you, Mackenzie and Alex. Good morning. So um, as mentioned, I'm Mackenzie. I'm with the Indianapolis Public Library. And I have my um, co-presenter here. He's off camera right now, but Alex Hampton. And we're both members of the technology learning team at the Indianapolis Public Library. And we've been on that team for about six years together now. Um, so we are going to talk today about developing tech intuition, so exploring common design patterns and user interface characteristics that you can teach your patrons to help them have the sort of intuitive response to a website or an app that we would expect from a high school user. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So this presentation is based off of an experience that Alex and I had of working with both high skilled and low skilled users on our team. So we teach people who are learning how to use the keyboard and mouse or learning to type for the very first time, but we also teach users who are learning how to code. We teach things like building websites with Wix, how to write HTML and CSS. And what we found is that we were teaching the high skilled users a particular approach to design that we could leverage in our teaching to low skilled users so that they could understand how to expect a website or app to work. So we're gonna walk you through some of those tips today. What we're gonna do is base our information off of a really common usability book. Um, so there's a guy named Steve Krug who wrote a book called Don't Make Me Think. He was sort of one of the innovators in the space of usability, what we might call user experience or user interface design nowadays. And his basic idea was that you should follow common sense design patterns so that your user knows what to expect in your website and app. And he came up with three laws and we're gonna share a little bit about how those three laws could help you develop intuition for yourself or for the patrons you may be teaching. So the very first law is going to be, don't make users think. So this one here can sound a little counterintuitive if you're trying to teach intuition because intuition you know, if you're trying to teach that, you want to teach people how to think. But it turns out that a well-designed website is meant to be sort of a gut reaction, I know where to go. So the idea is that if you have a well-designed website, when a user lands on your web page in 30 seconds or less, they know where to click or what to do to take the next step. So what this means for working with lower skilled users who may be encountering websites for the first time is if we can teach them the basics of how to navigate around a computer, if we can make sure they understand how to type, how to pull up a website, 
at that point, it's going to be all about helping them understand that they should trust their instinct. What we find is that because um, users who are learning technology for the first time expect it to be hard, sometimes they second guess their own choices. So one of the first things we do in our basic computer classes is we talk about, I'm going to give you a task and I want you to try and do it. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I want you to just guess. And nine times out of tens, most of the users can figure out what a really simple task is. So an example of this might be going to perhaps your local library website and asking them, using only the skills that I've taught you of how to click, try and answer a really basic question. So here we have the Indianapolis Public Library website. Something that we might ask a patron to do is find the hours for their local branch. And what we're hoping that they're going to do is just looking only at the words and only clicking, not typing anything, identify that there's a spot for location, recognizing that if they're able to scroll down, again, having those really basic skills, they can probably find a branch. And then we're gonna hope that they'll understand that if they don't see the information they need, they're probably gonna need to click a second time to pull up that information. So most low skill users left to their own devices, if they're told I'm gonna to give you X amount of time, try and figure this out, can probably follow their own gut instinct and make it to a page that will answer their question. But you kind of have to give them a little bit of permission. You have to say, I want you to trust your instinct. I think that you can do this. So the second law is related to this. The second law says, it doesn't matter how many times I have to click, as long as each click is a mindless, unambiguous choice. So there was a time in web design where there are these rules about if your user has to click more than three times, they're going to leave your website and not use it. This was about the time that Amazon was coming up with the idea of a single click add it to your shopping um, cart and buy sort of approach. But it turns out that the research for user experience shows that users are willing to click and stay on your website for a significant period of time, as long as they know that they're on the right path. The reason a user is going to stop engaging with your website or get confused is if they get disoriented, if the choice right in front of them doesn't seem obvious. So when we're working with low skilled users, what we want to think about is teaching them not to be afraid to click on the obvious choice. So in a learning environment, that can mean putting them on a website where they really can't break anything and trying to encourage them to follow that gut instinct again. But it also means that if designers are thinking about interaction with their website in terms of how many clicks or how the user is going to interact with it, we do need to make sure that the user has those basic skills. So for our computer basics classes here at the Indianapolis Public Library, what we tend to do is focus heavily on mouse skills, making sure that the user knows how to click. If we're teaching them how to interact with something through a smartphone, helping them understand the difference between a tap or a swipe or a pinch movement, Anything that sort of reinforces these are the ways that you'll be asked to interact with the computer. And here's how you can recognize which one of these is appropriate to use in a different situation. If you can teach them those basic skills, after that, hopefully in a well-designed website, everything else will follow along. It'll be relatively obvious. So a great way to demonstrate this is to give users a scenario that is shared across different websites. So one thing that we find um, all of our users want to do is run a basic Google search. Um, Google sort of runs the world nowadays on the, the World Wide Web. So putting a user on something like Google and saying, OK, I want you to run a search for you know, some sort of key search term. And once you're there, I want you to do x, y, and z. So give them some sort of task to follow up on. And again, reinforcing with them, I really want you to try and do this with only using your mouse. So again, if you ask them in the first scenario to try and find the library's hours, ask them to do the same thing in a different context. Ask them to search Google for a library and see if they can identify what the hours might be for that particular branch. The goal is to get them clicking and interacting. At this point, it can be a good idea to start talking about the different types of clicks that you might have to do. So I'm going to pull back up the Indianapolis Public Library website again. So helping them understand the difference between something like a hover. So right now I'm hovering over things so they might light up versus a click where I'm going to click and an action might happen. Helping them recognize that if they're over a text box, they might see an I beam. So they might have to click so that they can type. 
as really reinforcing that, those basic math skills as they're up here in a little block in the corner. Once they have those basic foundations done, if they trust their instincts and make the obvious choice, they can probably. Because law number three is going to focus on <clears throat> symbols. When we're teaching web designers how to build a website, we're always telling them, don't put words. All of us in the library world have made signs and watched patrons just walk right past them, right? No one stops to read something. People tend to react to symbols, things that they can recognize as patterns. So in the real world, if I want to try and tell someone, stop, this door is broken, I would put a big red stop sign. On the internet, what we try and do is reuse the same symbols over and over again that would meet a user's expectation for a label so that they can kind of have an idea about how to interact with the website. So law number three basically tells the designer, write your website, put all the content you think it should have, cut those words in half, and then cut them in half again, as few words as possible. And part of this is based on the idea that most users scan websites. So if we have a particular task in mind, if you're a higher skilled user who has good tech intuition, you're probably only reading about a third of the words that are actually on the page. You're looking for keywords or you're looking for symbols that you recognize. So in order to try and help reinforce this with lower skilled users, once they have those basic skills underway so that they can actually interact with the website, what we wanna try and do is help them recognize the symbols that they should expect and to understand what those symbols can mean in different contexts. So we might start showing them symbols and icons that they'll see over and over again on websites and trying to point out and reinforce where there are patterns or repetitions across websites. At this point, we really have to think about using a website kind of becomes like trying to read a map. But when we read maps, usually we get a little legend. So we might have all these weird symbols on a map, but there's a legend that's labeled and tells us what those symbols are. Learning to navigate around the web is kind of like trying to read a map, but there's no legend available. So as tech educators, our goal is to try and provide that legend to help people understand what the different symbols mean. And it turns out that there are some that are pretty universal. Maybe I do now. So for example, these icons that you see on this side are probably going to do the same thing. Yeah, but I know. It's not a perfect guarantee, but it's pretty, pretty common. Every once in a while, you'll get a designer out there who just gets it in their head that they should do something innovative and use a symbol in a weird way. But those are few and far between. So things like zooming in and out, helping users understand that they're probably looking for a percentage symbol. If they wanna share something, there are two symbols that are most commonly used. If you wanna email or have a URL that you can share with someone else. Of course, in the library, a big one is printing, helping them recognize what a print symbol is probably going to look like. Searching, most websites are search oriented nowadays. So helping them recognize where they can click to search are you know, a big um, help to low skilled users. But it turns out that most of the time icons aren't universal. So we can't just say, here are these icons and here's how they're gonna work. Sometimes we have what we call context icons. So these are icons that appear and depending on the context where they're appearing, the behavior might change. So an X, of course, if you're in a web browser, there's an X in the top right corner. If you click on it, everything closes. But if I'm interacting with a website that has a pop-up or maybe a message asking me to enroll in their mailing list, there's gonna be a small X that I might have to click to close that smaller window. So giving users, the exposure skilled users, the experience of seeing those symbols in different contexts and helping them understand how you can expect a website to behave in response to interacting with that becomes important. This is especially true. So one that I'm seeing um, nowadays with our users is helping them understand what a chat bubble might do. Since most users are smartphone users, even if they're not computer users, oftentimes a chat bubble is used for things like a text message app or 
the Facebook messaging app. So they often expect that if they click on a chat bubble, they're gonna be able to communicate with a live person. But on websites, sometimes this leads to a comment section. So it's not a live interactive chat. Increasingly, if you're on a company website, you're actually probably gonna be interacting with an artificial intelligence, an AI who's a bot, who's gonna kind of try and predict what you want as a response. We're also seeing this increasingly on government websites. So helping them see that chat bubble in a few contexts so they can understand which situation they might be in can be a valuable way to give them a broader understanding about what to intuitively expect from a website. Another one is arrows. Arrows show up everywhere in the user design. Sometimes an arrow might mean go back a step. Sometimes an arrow might have a little curve to it. So if you're in an email program, you might see a reply all or a forward button. All of those are going to be arrows. And to a user who's been interacting with them for a while, you start to develop an intuition for which arrow means what. But for users who've never encountered them before, they need someone to spend the time to point out how arrows can look in different situations and how you can expect them to behave as a result. And then plus or minus signs. So earlier I mentioned that percents were usually almost always going to be an opportunity for zooming in and out. Oftentimes those percents are paired with a plus or minus sign. But plus or minus signs are also used for increment and decrementing numbers. So if you're in a shopping cart, increasing the number of items you might have in it. Sometimes they're used to collapse or expand components on a website. So giving them an opportunity to see those in different contexts, again, just helps them develop that intuition. So some examples of how you can do this include, um, so of course, we're all in public libraries. Most of us have probably seen the Libby app, Overdrive's, you know, sort of uh, book and audiobook borrowing app. So Libby is a great tool to demonstrate where you might see a plus or minus sign and depending on where you're at, the situation might change. So here I am on the Libby's main page and you'll see there's these little minus signs along the side. If I click on one of those, it's gonna collapse something. If I click on an actual title, I'm gonna see a plus sign down here next to borrow. And this plus sign, because it's paired with another symbol, means I'm going to add this to my account. I'm gonna check this out. So this can give you a few places that you can look around and say, look, here's the same symbol, but in a different situation. Let's try and figure out from the context what it might mean. The other thing that I love about using Libby for demoing this is it has a share button. So this is the share button that a lot of times Apple users see. Um, Android tends to use that little network symbol a bit more commonly. But it gives you a chance to say, okay, well, why does this appear here? This is going to allow you to click on it and perhaps share this information with your email address, share it with another person. Um, so it can just give you a chance to sort of demonstrate here's where you might see the symbol and interact with it. Another great way to demonstrate all these symbols to a user, I tried to stick to library examples here for the most part today, a database. So many of our databases, when you land on the final product, you might be looking at a PDF or some other printable pages. And in most web browsers, when you interact with that, you're going to see a lot of these symbols in the wild. So here we see a percent sign and I have a plus or minus that's going to allow me to zoom in or out. Over here, I see my download symbol. I see my print button so I can practice printing. I see these little three dots over here. Alex is gonna talk about these in more detail. But it gives you an opportunity to sort of try and explain, here's what these symbols might do. Before we click on them, let's try and guess what's going to happen. So I would recommend looking at these types of websites, um, a couple of them with different ways of using these symbols in a single session with a lower skilled user. Now, sometimes you're not teaching a class. Sometimes you're just helping someone over the shoulder. So one thing that we try and do when we're helping users just out in the wild of the library answering basic questions is make sure that when we are showing them how to do something, we're trying to use appropriate language and trying to reinforce those design patterns in every interaction because over time they start to pick up, oh, when you say we're going to zoom in, so we're gonna click on the plus sign, this is what I'm looking for. So if I were to encounter something like this out in the wild, just helping a patron over the shoulder, you know, they're probably trying to figure out how to print. They're trying to get a specific task done. I don't wanna spend 10 minutes narrating over their shoulder about what all the symbols mean. 
But I might say, oh, you're trying to print. Well, that means we're going to look for the little printer symbol. That usually means that we're printing across multiple websites. So just trying to reinforce over and over again, this is a pattern that you can start to recognize over time. So another one that I like to um, show is for um, <clears throat> Is some sort of a government website. Most of the government websites have a pretty standard set of layouts. So it's a really good place to show things like buttons. Um, usually you can again find some sort of printable form. It's a good place to have people practice searching. So if you're trying to file your taxes, you know, have them practice searching for a particular tax form in here. Um, another good one is the Social Security Administration website. They have a lot of symbols on their main page that can really reinforce these design patterns. So they have a search symbol that you have to click on to bring up the search. They have a menu symbol that they've actually labeled. Um, so th this can be a great place to sort of demonstrate a couple of these icons and then say, here's a website. I want you to find them and try and predict what they're going to do. Another one that I really like is if you pull up something like Microsoft Online. Microsoft has done this great thing where because they recognize that there's no legend for their icons, there's no way for you to determine what the map's going to do. When you hover over things, if it's not already labeled, it'll give you um, a sort of pop-up tool tip that says, hey, this is what this does. So the goal is just to make sure that you're providing your user a chance to see these symbols over and over again in a couple different contexts to help build their understanding and their intuition for it. But you do have to be a little bit careful because <laughs> If you're teaching users to look for symbols, sometimes those symbols change. This is particularly true for smartphone apps. Smartphone apps have a tendency to want to stay on top of the design trends. So if you have been teaching your patrons to look for the Instagram camera, to look at their you know, kids' Instagram post, and all of a sudden it changes to something that clearly is meant to be a some sort of camera, but doesn't quite look like it, they can become really disoriented and not know where to go. So again, when you're thinking about teaching users to look for these patterns, it's also important to make sure you're using the correct name and the correct terminology. So don't teach someone, hey, look for the camera, help them understand, well, the camera represents the Instagram app. So we're gonna click on the camera to launch Instagram. Because then if something changes, they have the correct language to ask for help. So they don't come in and say, I can't find the camera on my phone because I'm going to assume they want to take a photo and not look for Instagram. But if they can come in and say, I used to get to Instagram by looking for the camera, then I can help them understand this is the new icon that you're looking for. So always make sure you're reinforcing the correct terminology and how you're navigating things, not just the symbols. So a really great final step if you're teaching low skilled users to navigate websites, trying to reinforce that intuition is to give them an activity where you're asking them to scan a website. So give them a couple tasks to do, give them a very short time limit to do it so that they can't sit there and read the entire website. Things that I like to do are ask them to find the navigation menu, ask them to run a search and reinforce that that search should have you know, three words or less. Make sure that they understand how to scroll to the bottom of the page to find the footer because sometimes more information is down there. And one of uh, the ones that I love to do is put them on a website that I'm reasonably familiar with and just tell them, I want you to click around as many times as you can. So basically get really, really lost. And then we're gonna try and get back to where you started. So I like to do this on our library's website. Um, so you can put a user on here and say, I'm gonna give you 90 seconds. And in that 90 seconds, I want you to click on as many links as you can. And when you're done, we're gonna try and go back to the homepage. Because oftentimes they'll have just kind of clicked through these mindless links here at the top, land on a couple pages. If you're lucky, they're gonna click something like I just did where all of a sudden it opened a new tab and you can talk about what happens when you click a link that takes you to a different website and how you can get back. If they're on this main web page, you can talk about if you ever get lost, most major websites are going to have an icon in the top left corner. And if you click on it, it's going to take you back to your home page so you can start over again. It just allows you to say, hey, you can't break anything and reinforce as long as you're trying to make the best choice, you can always go back and fix things if it's not going well. 
The other thing is, of course, searching. So when it comes to searching, most users tend to have to expect to ask a full question. And we try and reinforce that if you see a search bar, what you really want to be thinking about is putting in as few words as possible. You can always add more words in, but if you put in too many words, of course, you might not get a good result. So a fun one to do here in Indianapolis, because we have a cat cafe, is to give people a couple different versions of trying to find um, the cat cafe. So I might tell them, I want you to search for Nine Lives Cat Cafe in Fountain Square. So have one person search that on their screen. And of course, they're going to find the exact result. But I could ask another user to just type in cat cafe. Ideally, spell it correctly, cat cafe. <laughs> And what you're going to discover is that both of these searches are going to um, wind up with having almost identical results. This is also something that you can see if you go to somewhere like Libby and search for book titles. Searching for two words in a title versus the entire title oftentimes give you the same results. So sort of teaching um, the user that the search box is there to help them quickly find information and help them understand that you don't have to have everything, you just have to have enough that you can find the correct link to, to click. So just again, reinforces, if you can get close enough, then intuition can, can take over, you can make the obvious choice. So I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Alex here. He's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about some specific design patterns and then mobile navigation on smartphones. Okay. So we're going to talk now a little bit about kind of the differences that you will see between mobile and desktop navigation for websites. Um, one of the things that you will notice is that there's been kind of a rise um, in terms of what's called mobile first design, which means that websites are often designed now where they are thinking first about those smartphone and tablet users, because there are so many people that that is their whole experience of the internet really is through the smartphone that they have. Um, so a lot of times you will see designs that kind of are more oriented towards those mobile patterns versus some of the things that we've maybe been used to seeing with traditional uh, desktop and laptop oriented websites. Um, so a lot of times you kind of are seeing that experience become more unified, but it's still good to be able to teach users to kind of recognize those differences between sort of the mobile icons and patterns versus the more traditional desktop icons and patterns, because of course, depending on the device they are using, they may have a different experience. Um, so you're usually able to find something that represents a menu on your screen. In this slide, in this example, we have what's called a hamburger menu, which is those three lines stacked on top of each other. And what that's gonna do, most of you have already encountered this in your lives is when you tap on it, it expands the menu out. So instead of having a horizontal menu that's always accessible across the top of the website, a hamburger menu kind of folds it together and it only appears if you ask for it. Um, so that concept of sometimes you have to ask the mobile sites to do something, it's not just already there for you, is important to reinforce for people. Um, and it's not always a hamburger menu. Of course, there are a couple of different ones that we're gonna explore. So let's go ahead and look at some of the primary differences just in terms of mobile systems between Android and Apple. They are very similar. They can do pretty much all the same things at this point, but the experience of using one versus the other can be confusing for people. Um, so in, I just have two quick examples of this. So this particular slide talks about what's called the primary navigation destinations, essentially the ways that you get from one page to another, um, usually on, when you're on a web site. Um, so in this case, this shows that Android has those primary navigations kind of all over the screen. There's stuff across the top, there's stuff across the bottom. So users on Android really have to understand that they're probably gonna have to look at the whole screen. And that is a little bit different from the way that iPhone and iPad users are gonna see it. Those primary navigation destinations are gonna be across the bottom of their screen extremely consistently. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of knowing where to look and also knowing what to expect based on the system that you're working with. 
And here's another example. This is just like an adding a uh, event to a calendar, very common app um, across any mobile device. So we have what's called the primary action button, which is sort of the, the main thing that you might expect to do when you open that app. So if you open a calendar app, the primary action that you expect that the app designers also expect is that you're gonna wanna add a new event to your calendar. You open the calendar, you need to add something to it. So in this case, we see that common little plus sign. With Android, it kind of floats in the bottom corner um, of the screen on the right hand side, whereas Apple puts it at the top right. It's an incredibly similar symbol across both systems, but it is in a different place. Um, so honestly, a lot of developing mo mobile based intuition is sort of learning how to expect what the next thing's going to be. It's almost a little bit of like learning to predict what the next step uh, is going to is going to be and to follow those um, patterns that you've seen before to navigate around. So here's a selection of just really common menu styles. They all kind of have these cutesy little names. A lot of them are food based. So they're uh, kind of easy to remember as a group. So you have hamburger, like we talked about those three lines stacked on top of each other. Um, when you have like a little nine squares, that's usually called like a bento menu. Um, you'll see that on like the Google homepage to navigate from different Google services, like to get to drive or get to photos. There's one of those. Um, and then you have the kebab and the meatball, which are functionally the same. They're just oriented differently. So kebab are the three dots up and down and the meatball are the three dots horizontally. And they generally do the exact same thing, right? You tap on them and then you can see all of the options for that site or for that page. Breadcrumb is a little bit different. Um, this is maybe more similar to like following a file path. Um, where you're actually seeing the different steps laid out for you. So by the time you see a one, two, three, four on the page, your user is probably on page four. And it's very easy to tell from that style of menu how they might go back several steps because you could literally click on the page two or the page three or the page one and go back a couple of steps. Hover is a little bit harder for people to come to grips with because you oftentimes are not gonna see it unless you have a device with a mouse and you are positioning your mouse in such a way that you can see um, those options pop up. So hover can be a little bit hard to teach. Um, an example is often something that's got a PDF in it. If you go to the IRS website and bring up the 1040, uh, you can easily hover over that top right hand corner from most computers and you will kind of see those options pop up. Um, I have a question about what other names for the menu styles have you found helpful for patrons? Honestly, I don't know that people benefit so much from knowing that, you know, in the design world, it's called a hamburger or a meatball menu. A lot of times you're more trying to um, describe what it looks like. Somebody else mentions uh, grid for a bento. So sometimes it's more, I probably describe like the three dots and the three lines more than I would actually use their cutesy little names. It just depends on who you're working with, what you think might be memorable. I've had some patrons say like, you know, they, they really know to look for the hamburger now and that's helpful for them. But a lot of times just kind of describing what the, what the actual symbol entails is more helpful for people because they're able to retain that better. It really just depends on the person. Um, yeah, domino tile, that's, that's another one that people have used for that bento menu. So it's not perfectly standard, but these are just some of the, the common names that have that similar thread. Okay, so now I wanna talk about a couple of different options for menus. And I have these little animations here on each um, slide. So this is an accordion menu. It is collapses and expands based on where you tap. So this one is a fairly intuitive one for people as long as there aren't too many options. <laughs> if you have somebody tap it and it expands out into 37 things and that they then have to scroll through, sometimes that's a little much. Um, but usually people are kind of able to understand the, the nested concept here. Um, so that one is not super complicated. Carousel, you're gonna see on both mobile sites and desktop sites where you are actually clicking or sometimes swiping through those different options. 
This can be especially confusing for people because they're not able to see all of the options at one time. And if they don't realize that they have to hover over this, click on it, swipe on it to figure out what those options are, this can be a real stumbling block for people. And a lot of websites, there isn't any labeling that tells you you have to do this. So you just kind of have to be able to recognize that this is gonna offer you different options and you have to interact with it in order to be able to see them. Um, so you're gonna see those on pretty much all the library digital borrowing sites, things like uh, Libby, Canopy. It's just become really common because it's, I don't know, allows you to fit a lot of information into one horizontal space, I guess. Um, so those you will see a lot. If somebody else mentioned seeing Zillow, that that's how you see the pictures on a Zillow listing, that's true. So you have to have that kind of recognition for this pattern that you have to interact with it. A drop down is probably one of the menu types that everybody's most familiar with because it's probably the most traditional one, right? You go to a desktop website, this is kind of what you're gonna expect to see. I usually use the example of a filing cabinet with my patrons when we talk about these, that you know, if you walk into a filing cabinet, you would only see the labels on the outside of the drawer. You can't necessarily see what's in each cabinet drawer unless you pull the drawer out. So clicking on, or in sometimes some cases hovering over these different labels are gonna allow you to see what they contain. So this one I would say is one of the easier ones to teach. Um, it can have, you know, that, that same stumbling block of they don't see it immediately without interacting with it, but I think it's a little bit easier for people to grasp than say the carousel. Then there's modal, which I do think is a difficult one for people to learn. So the concept of the modal menu is that you make some kind of selection in an app or on a website. And essentially the next thing that you see blocks the entire screen until you make the next choice. So designers love it because it makes your user focus down on answering one thing, inputting one bit of information. Um, but for users, this can be very disorienting because all of a sudden the screen that they thought they were looking at is displaced by something else. And it may look quite a bit different. Um, so this is one that can be very jarring for people and it's important because it is used so much in mobile design. So this idea of, well, you have to make a selection and then you will be you know, either taken to the next appropriate screen or perhaps return to the one that you came from. Either of those things can happen and they're both normal. Um, so modal is a little bit challenging to work with, but it's very common and users need to know about it. And then I also want to mention the concept of a notification dot. So this is when there is some kind of notification for usually an app that you have on a mobile device. There is a message for them. Maybe they need to update the app. There is something that they need to deal with that comes from that app. And this is one that people often do not connect the dots. They, they don't understand that seeing that little dot appear on the icon corresponds to a notification that they need to find. Um, so they're going to need to open the app or go into their actual notifications menu to deal with that. And that's the only way that dot is going to disappear. So I can't tell you how many times I've had patrons that have just phones that are covered <laughs> with these little dots on basically all their apps because maybe they don't have automatic updates turned on or they don't really know where to go to see their notifications. So this can be kind of an involved thing to solve, but just taking that first step with people to help them understand that if you see this dot, there is a reason to open that app. There is something in there that you need to do or maybe just dismiss. Um, you know, Maybe it's not a big deal, but something needs to be dealt with here. So that is important. We have a couple of resources that we wanted to show off today in terms of things that help people to come to grips with some of these concepts. So I'm just gonna show uh, just briefly these four things. So the first one is a practice web form. Let me move this over here. There we go. So this gives you the ability to have somebody practice typing, clicking, um, you know, selecting different options. There's a little calendar. 
Uh, that's obviously that's extremely common with online paperwork, even job applications, you will have to pick like a, an exact start date and an exact end date for jobs that you held usually. So these are really nice ways to engage with really common design features that somebody would have to use. There's a way to have them upload a file, things like that. And because it's just a practice web form, there are no consequences here. This isn't gonna hurt you. This isn't gonna, you know, you're not practicing with anything that's actually important. So you're able to um, easily practice with that. Then we also have mouse practice. This is one that we use a lot in our basic uh, mouse skills class. So this is an essentially an exercise that walks people through in words what they want to do and gets them practicing moving the mouse around the screen to do lots of different tasks. At the beginning, it's just kind of this point and shoot aiming at these numbers, but it gets more complex as it goes. And it's a really nice um, exercise to practice that dexterity with the mouse, which like Mackenzie said, really is the key to becoming more confident um, using a computer is getting really good at using a mouse. The third resource I wanna point you to is the um, symbol guide here. So this is essentially a little bit of a legend for many of the common symbols that people may see. Um, it goes on for quite a while. It's got a lot of symbols in here. Um, so this isn't something that I necessarily would hand to a patron and then leave because it's very long, um, but it's more something that I might use pieces of to teach a specific skill. Um, you know, I might make somebody a printout of a specific area that they that we have been working with just to give them some reinforcement on that information. And then there are also some nice mobile device lessons over on our friend GCF Learn Free. So if you're not familiar with GCF Learn Free, it is a wonderful resource that has lots and lots of tech training. Um, there are videos, there are lots of written lessons. So this is a great uh, resource that we use a lot and it gives you a lot of good information that you can use. Um, there are even pages that a lot of times we'll use in like one-on-one -on -one instruction. If we have somebody book an appointment like that, you can literally just fire this up, scroll down the page and talk about their different points. They're great at showing examples of everything that's here. Um, so this is something that we lean on a lot in our instruction and wanted to, to highlight for you today. So that is my final example. Um, we do wanna thank you so much for coming to our session today. If you have questions, feel free to shoot Mackenzie an email. Her email is uh, on the screen for you. And I guess we're gonna do questions with the time that we've got left. Thank you so much, Mackenzie and Alex. That was wonderful. I feel like whenever I was watching this, it seems like, you know, whenever you are a uh, prolific computer user, you forget <laughs> that you really do need to drill down to the basics, you know, to teach people how to use uh, the internet. And it's just, you, I think I take it for granted and just hearing you guys, you know, break it down. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you really do kind of have to have some experience to understand what those symbols mean. So I really, I really think it's great. I loved it. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to um, ask? I'm gonna go ahead and put the TL, TLEU certificate link in the um, chat so that you can request a TLEU uh, certificate, if that's something that you need. All right, just fill that out and I will send out certificates after probably next week. Um, you know, give us some time. Uh, we will also be transcribing this and adding it to our archive webinar page. Uh, but, you know, we'll have several to do, so it won't be Monday before we get that done. But within a week or two, we'll have to try to have all that. Uh, finished and posted on our website. And we're getting lots of good comments. Thank you, informative pre presentation. Uh, and I totally agree. 
Very, very good. So glad. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Mackenzie and Alex. Absolutely. And I hope all of you will um, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any follow-up questions or comments or would like some additional links. Um, Alex and I have, like I said, been working with low-skilled users exclusively um, almost for about six years now. So we have a lot of resources we've built up. If you're someone who's trying to expand out your um, outreach at your library in that area, we're always happy to sort of talk shop and um, share some resources. That's Absolutely. great. Sorry, Alex, I didn't mean to. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> All right. Um, well, if you have any questions, uh, just put them in the chat or like Mackenzie said, you can follow up with them directly. Uh, I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat one more time. Uh, that is just a link that you can fill out to request a TLEU certificate. All right. Well, I am going to stop the recording.